Good morning. Thanks for joining us for this session. I am Rachel Horn, Head of Marketing and Comms for the Filecoin Foundation. Uh, Filecoin is a decentralized storage platform that's powered by a cryptocurrency, and the foundation exists as one of many organizations in this open source community to grow and support the ecosystem. I have an incredible panel here and an incredible topic to discuss to dive into, which is Web3, the metaverse, the decentralized web. I think we will throw in blockchain and crypto just so that we have a full house. Uh, but I want to uh, quickly go down the line and introduce my panelists. To my left is Bill Rockwood, Executive Director of the Future Forum and Legislative Director on the Hill to Representative Darren Soto. Next to him is Clev Mesador, Public Policy Advisor for the Blockchain Association. Kurt Opshaw is the uh, Deputy Executive Director of EFF and also its general counsel. And finally, at the end, we have Dr. Susan Persky, who is the director of the Immersive Simulation Program at the Human Genome Institute. So thank you all for being here. Let us dive in. And I think, um, Kurt, I want to start with you by really defining some of these terms. Um, again, we have Metaverse, D-Web, and Web3 in our, in our title here. I think in particular, if you could explain the distinction between the decentralized web and Web3. Uh, well, so that, it's a very good question, but I think that it's a challenging one because uh, people often use these terms interchangeably, or sometimes uh, a person may use uh, a meaning to it that is different from how it's being perceived. Uh, they think, you know, Web three uh, is, a, is a play on on the Web two, a term from about twenty years back, which was describing the shift of of the World Wide Web into more social media, user generated content uh, being layered on top of uh, the original version of of the web. And so, Web three is trying to describe layering things on top of Web two, uh, often uh, using technologies like decentralization and uh, blockchain technologies. Um, decentralized web is more of a descriptive term. It is, and I, I kind of prefer that term because of its descriptive nature, because it's looking at the goal, which is to to find a a way of. Uh, re-decentralizing the World Wide Web. As you may recall, some of you might uh, remember the early web. There was a lot of decentralization. You could have a web server uh, in your house, uh, and people could operate them and be both uh, a publisher and, and consumer. Uh, and over time, the, the web got more and more centralized. And the thing about decentralization is trying to make a a web that is interoperable, that is locked open, uh, and more resistant to attempts to centralize and, and control that, uh, which can help protect against uh, having a single point of failure that could be used for control, for surveillance. Uh, and both of these concepts are within the terms, but I think decentralized web at least focuses on that goal. Clev. Uh, I want you to jump in here because I know you've talked before about how Web 2 is a chance to correct some of the mistakes of the original web and sort of where we, where we are now. Can, can you dive into that a little bit? Well, I'm Clev Mesado. I lead the National Policy Network of Women of Color and Black Chain, but I'm also an advisor to the Black Chain Association. I've actually been in this space for about six years, and, and, and the prospect of a decentralized web is... For me, because as you mentioned, we haven't really come to consensus about what is Web3. But for me, it is really about leveraging technologies like blockchain, like machine learning, like artificial intelligence to tackle some of the issues that plague users, right? Their data is sold and monetized without their permission. There's all of these hacks and breaches and you know, polarizing content, and no one seems to know how to solve it. So the prospect of being able to create a decentralized web where there's peer-to-peer -peer interactions that are authentic, but also being able to potentially do microtransactions. Now, I am concerned, right, because as you mentioned, you know, the web, the internet was supposed to decentralize us. When we debated policy around the internet in the 1990s, we didn't have conversations about financial literacy. And today we have a digital divide. 
We didn't have an, enough conversations about accessibility and non-technical users. And look at where we are. So we not only have an opportunity to address some of the issues that plague the WEG, because it's still very popular, people want to use it and need it, but it's really how do we make sure it's accessible and how do we create a decentralized web that actually is accessible to users who never were able to effectively participate. That's great. So to sort of tie those together, and then Bill, I'm going to turn it to you. So the original intent, the original web as it was built was this peer-to-peer -peer communication platform. Then these platform technologies were sort of built over top of that first layer of the web. And now we're moving back into this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer interaction. But it is facilitated by, in many ways, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So uh, Bill, if you want, now that we've sort of laid out the structural groundwork, if you can talk to us about where blockchain and crypto come in. Yeah. Um, first of all, my name is Bill Rockwood. Uh, as mentioned, and I have to do my standard uh, government statement, that all views are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of Congressman Soto or the Future Forum. Um, and just for a little context, he is the uh, co-chair of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus and passed the first digital asset bill out of the House of Representatives and the first uh, blockchain bill. So now that I did that, I forgot the question. Uh, uh, crypto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what is crypto? <laughs> what is crypto? Um, so I, I think this is a very timely discussion because we're just seeing the implications of what uh, an unregulated Web 2 and some of the issues uh, Clev brought up um, have kind of just hit regulators uh, and, and government folks. And like there's actually a hearing tomorrow about algorithmic bias and a lot of those things of um, some of these, these data concerns. So crypto itself is a, a money movement device and uh, blockchain, the, the system that underlies it, I just said it's a different way to structure data. You know, in Web 2, you had incentives for these big companies with data farms to just hold and gather all the data in one central place so that whenever you access the internet, it was in one repository, more or less. And some of the issues with that is obviously it's a huge um, energy uh, consumption because you have to run the whole machinery the entire time. You're literally telling the hackers where to look. It's like, it's in there, you know, hack that. And um, so crypto and blockchain represent a bit of a paradigm shift just because they literally structure the data differently. You know, uh, these distributed networks where, um, you know, it's localized. So if you hack uh, anything, you only have access to the node. You only have to use the power to operate the individual node. So I think it's more important to think of the system itself and the technology and sort of uh, crypto is just the money piece of that where a lot of, you know, even in Web 2, it was Wall Street and uh, algorithmic trading that really dr drove those. So crypto is really the first successful use case of blockchain technology. That's great. Yeah, um, it facilitates these trustless transactions so that all of this can be built automatically without these central intermediaries. And, and as you talk about data, I think that this is a good uh, moment to bring Susan into the discussion uh, with a unique perspective, but a lot of this data is being uh, is required to build the metaverse, which is the last component of this discussion. So can you chime in? I think probably many people in this room saw the Super Bowl ad for Meta, which painted a version of what the metaverse could look like, but there's also a decentralized metaverse. There are platforms like Somnium and others where you can build a truly decentralized metaverse. Can you talk to us about uh, what the metaverse is and what it, what the role of data build data is? Sure. So that is the big question. Um, I mean, I think the first thing to make sure that, you know, we all think about is that from, from most people's perspective in this area, we would say the metaverse does not yet exist. Um, so, you know, people who are developing the metaverse or making this or that for the metaverse, you know, the, what they're creating for is not what I would term as the metaverse that we're hoping and expecting to see 5, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, so, I mean, the idea of the metaverse is really to have a completely interoperable system, uh, persistent, it exists whether or not you as a person are signed on. Um, there are, you know, places we can bring together people, things, experiences, um, and make it sort of seamless, right? So moving away from these walled gardens we have now where everything uh, would be sort of existing in the same, you could think of it as sort of a, a meta world in a way. 
um, where the world basically has a digital component or a digital twin uh, that you could interact with. Um, so, I mean, data, of course, is everything. Everything is digital. Everything depends on data, right? And so that's going to be the huge question. Um, whose data, how, you know, I think a lot of visions people have for the metaverse are that we are all creators, um, we have ownership, we have an economy. You know, these are the things that are going to lie on the bedrock of what everyone else has, has already talked about. You know, but in, in general, I think the way to think about it is it's this convergence of a maturing of a whole bunch of technologies all at once. Um, you know, my perspective on it is from the um, XR immersive uh, kind of component, and that's what we sort of think is going to be one of the main ways that you're going inter to interface with the metaverse, you know, is to sort of have it available to you in 3D in a way where you feel like you are there, as opposed to sort of sitting in the room you're sitting in wearing your headset or, you know, whatever the technology starts to look like in 10 years from now. Um, so it's a huge kind of concept. There are different people have definition, different definitions, but that's, I think, a place to start. That's great. Also, I want to note that if we have time at the end, we'll open it up to questions to so start thinking about that now. Um, now that we've sort of laid out these technologies and what they are, and I think, Susan, you started to talk about this, like the why they matter question. And I think we've seen, you know, like when you look at what's happening in Ukraine now, it is a, such a strong use case for decentralized communications platforms. So people whose voices are being oppressed or in the case of like, you know, against the spread of misinformation, like the tools built on these tech, decentralized technologies really shine. Filecoin, which is the project that I work on, um, is this decentralized storage technology. But our mission at its core is to preserve humanity's most important information. And that means making sure that people's voices who are otherwise unheard are heard, making sure that, um, you know, misinformation is is appropriately, uh, you know, noted and, and that people can understand truth from fiction and that we're cataloging information online. So, Kurt, you know, from EFF's vantage point, I'm sure this is pretty close to what you're working on, too. How do you think about these decentralized technologies for civil liberties? Uh, absolutely. I, I think that they are uh, very important for civil liberties uh, and in part because of the challenges that we've had with the centralization of control, where there is a, a single location which has the potential to become a sort of one-stop shop for uh, uh, a, you know, government to come to uh, obtain information about the users or for a, uh, uh, you know, a black hat hacker to come to take the data that is there or for the, the corporation itself to be gathering the, the information and, and using it in ways that uh, maybe the, the users don't like. Uh, and so sort of decentralizing and moving away from a centralized model can make it more challenging for uh, these activities. And I think, you know, Highlighting out of uh, the situation in, in uh, Ukraine and, and with Russia uh, is that uh, if you are faced with an authoritarian regime, uh, that uh, it is good to, to have it so it's harder to get at, at your information and harder for them to be able to uh, censor that information. And what we have seen uh, is in, in, in the wake of some of the, uh, the news coming out of Ukraine in Russia, they have taken steps to restrict access to uh, social media, to, to Twitter, uh, and, uh, and Facebook um, in an attempt to use their more centralized control uh, and pressure that can be put on. And this is in line with some things we've seen around the world where a push for localization, trying to get uh, the servers of the large companies to be in the jurisdiction, subject to the jurisdiction, so that they can enforce their, uh, their laws on censorship and preventing conversations. Uh, and so having more decentralized methods of, of communication or being able to share share information can be very helpful in fighting against that. And there's some technologies that are being promoted now, like uh, there is a Briar app that uh, can allow people to communicate with their uh, smartphones uh, in a situation where the internet is is out uh, with encrypted communications. And you know, thus far, I don't believe the internet has yet been shut down in Ukraine, but that may be uh, something to at least prepare for. Uh, and you can also have uh, uh, technologies that will allow people to get information out uh, that are that are hard to uh, hard to stop. And getting information out from a conflict zone is very important for helping people find out about misuses. So yeah, I think uh, decentralization is can be at least well well made. Decentralization will be critical for civil liberties.
Exactly. And it's not just about action, communication. It's also about getting funding to people, right? So, Clev, I'm sure you have something to say about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think what we're seeing in Ukraine is what we've seen in terms of global adoption of cryptocurrency. Globally, and even here in the U.S., people who have been locked out of the traditional financial system are gravitating towards cryptocurrency. And that's the same what we're seeing in, in Ukraine when it comes to the currency, when it comes to the central bank, you know, shutting things down and people not being able to access their monies, but people are able to get them cryptocurrency. And certainly communication as well, people who have been locked out of communication systems. Here in the U.S., we know that Black and Latino communities lead mainstream adoption of crypto by double digits, and that is because of having been locked out of the traditional financial system. And, and I would say, you know, there's, there's you know, full disclosure, there's concern about, in the Ukraine, right, both sides are using cryptocurrency, right? But I think we need to focus on the people who have been lo locked out, you know, or dictators, leaders, whatever you want to call them, are always going to find tools to do what they need to do. But in the past, the only reason that their rule has maintained is because the masses did not have any options. They didn't have any access. They didn't have any resources. And now they're empowered with a tool like cryptocurrency where they're not just, or crypto, they're not just locked out of communication. They can get communication out in a secure and safe manner, but they can get access to necessary resources to be safe and actually have that level of freedom and control. Great. Uh, does anybody else want to weigh in on where we are with these technologies and, and helping people? Yeah. Um, and, and I think one aspect we need to also keep in mind is uh, the unalterable nature of uh, distributed ledger technology. You know, two instances that predate this that are really important to bring up now. If you look at the Russian um, election hack of 2016, the original six or 14 subpoenas that came out of that were actually because they were Bitcoin transactions that they could trace back to the, the people involved. And you can't alter that. One of the greatest weapons of, you know, uh, authoritarian states is their flow of information. Um, and when you can't alter those things, it creates, you know, a, a truth uh, aspect that you can't hide. And, and also that was one of the reasons that China had such a strong reaction to crypto because people were using the uh, Bitcoin network to share pieces of sensitive information. And once it's out there, they can't change it, you know, that it's a, a government-free system. So I think that's one piece uh, that there are going to be these misinformation and amplification uh, things through, you know, social media. But I think that's one of the things that scares uh, dictators most about these technologies is once it's out there, you can't go and alter it. There's somewhere that that code exists. And I think that is one of the, the core values of um, a lot of people that operate in the system. Right. And, and to add to that, it's, you know, there's this mis misconception that Bitcoin is anonymous. It is not. It is pseudonymous. And you can figure out, and we've seen cases of government being able to retrieve, you know, stolen assets because you can work backwards through the system. And blockchain forensics has been a huge tool for law enforcement here in the U.S. and globally as well. And many people are not aware some of the biggest blockchain companies exist to help governments and law enforcement track the public keys. So while it's not about Clev being a criminal, it's about truly being able to finally follow the money. Yeah. I feel that we are too far into this conversation and haven't talked about policy, which is like we are in D.C. talking about, uh, I think we should, I would like to pivot and Bill, start with you, you know, from your perch on the hill, sort of what are the policy considerations around data or other issues? Yeah, uh, perch on the hill, that, that may, <laughs> um, I think we are again at a, a bit of a pivot point, um, you know, especially in these discussions where you know, again, we have a big hearing tomorrow. Uh, so I think we're at a bit of a nexus between the old internet and the new internet. And I think even if you look at blockchain and crypto and, and some of these, you know, even further down the road topics, I think they, 
unease a lot of policymakers because there is a layer of understanding. So there's this dual conversation where it's advancing this policy discussion, but also there's a lot of 101 slash this is what this stuff is. You know, I think a lot of people recognize, uh, you know, that maybe Washington wasn't as engaged on the front end uh, in the rise of the Internet. There was a very hands-off thing, and I'm not saying that's bad, but it's just we need to be very thoughtful, and there needs to be a layer of education. So when some of these things do come down the road, we don't have to educate folks and policymakers if a bad thing happens. Or when a lot of people hear these things, they immediately gravitate towards the negative. You know, the technology is a tool. It's, it's neutral. Um, but we need to make sure, um, and, that, and that's why I keep saying pivot point, because I think we are at a, a, a point where the average member of Congress or a lot of agencies are starting to get more involved. And um, what I would say for the folks involved in this space, that you have to have a, a degree of, of patience and you have to meet the person where they're coming from. You know, if they're asking questions, even if they're stupid or rudimentary, you have to be able to have that conversation because I, th I think that's the biggest thing that will help everyone on the policy front is if we can bridge that divide between, you know, the private sector and the great work they're doing and the people that are just coming up to this, this yeah. uh, speed on this stuff now. I think um, this past summer's infrastructure bill was like a huge wake up <laughs> to the industry, um, you know, about you know, the level of understanding of words like broker, who is a broker, what is a broker. Um, and I think it really galvanized the industry. Um, Clev, what are you seeing on the Hill and in the White House? Yeah, it's interesting with blockchain cryptocurrencies held to this unrealistic standard, right? When you look at the arc of legislation, how long did it take us to pass campaign finance reform? Did we, ever, did we ever pass Social Security reform? I'm not sure. But it takes a long time, but there's this, you know, there's this desire to move quickly, move quickly, move quickly. The good news is there is a lot of legis legislation already in place, right? This is not an unregulated space. You know, blockchain, ex crypto exchanges have to comply with state regulations. They have to register at the state level. Our exchanges, our companies that we have to we have to comply with KYC and AML, and you have to pay your taxes. The IRS, you know, tax form has all of that. We, I would say, where we are at with 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 regulation, especially based on the work we're doing at the Blockchain Association, I think Bill is right in terms of education, education, education. But I think where we need, where we are at is we need regulatory clarity. The issue is not the fact that the crypto industry wants to dodge, you know, regulation. Even the people who'd prefer to have no regulation have had to concede we need something. But we need Washington to get together, right? Right now, there's a lot of uncertainty on the regulatory front in terms of which regulatory bodies have oversight, right? And we know there's this tension between the CFTC and the SEC on this. And then Congress, you know, is taking... Is, is, doing quite a bit, you know, Congressman Soto's has been awesome in terms of crypto, but, but also moving legislation forward as well. So we've had successes on the House side. We're making some inroads on the Senate side with Senate banking and some of the members there, but it's going to take time. But in the meantime, unfortunately, what we're seeing is regulation by enforcement. The SEC is really creating this environment where you're not sure if you can innovate here in the U.S. Because at any given moment, you can be complying one day and not in compliant the next day. Now, you know, the White House has been I don't want to say quiet on crypto, but the infrastructure bill was our first engagement because of the pay for section. We, I think we would have been happy to pay, help pay for the infrastructure bill, just not that way. <laughs> like, because the expansion of def, the definition of broker actually put a huge burden specifically on black and Latino innovators in crypto because we're the ones who actually would not be able to comply. And we're, the, the bill is law, and we're still trying to work through how we fix that. But 
you know, Washington has indicated that they don't want to do this undue burden on software and hardware developers and miners and stakers. Now, the White House did put out the presidential working group report on stable coins, which has led some of the conversations. And we saw the two hearings two weeks ago in the Senate and, and House side. So this conversation about stable coins is important. Payments is an issue. Last year, the the White House threatened to put out a crypto czar. I say threatened because it never happened. And right now, where we've got an indication that an executive order is coming, we're hoping that that executive order will lead to more clarity. Obviously, you know, more guidance on stable coins is probably expected. And I think there's going to be a push to get some coordination among the agencies to help put together a pathway for legislation to actually move across both chambers. But but I will say, you know, I focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we need inclusive policymaking. Too often, the policies that come out of Washington force some of the inequities. One of them is the SEC accreditors, accredited investor rule that actually keeps you know, people of color out of building wealth. So we need to make sure that we're, being, we're fostering inclusive policies, but we also need to invest more in financial literacy and skills training. When you look at the future of work, right, stable coins is not just a possibility of being able to have a way to deliver stimulus payments to the most vulnerable, but we're seeing the greatest adoption with working class people here in the U.S., they should be able to get paid in cryptocurrency. The adoption is already there. And one of the things I'm proposing is we can do, we're not there to comply with iOS regulations in terms of you know, companies meeting those requirements, but people can, we, we can make it easier for employers to have people direct deposit funds into their accounts. So there's a lot that we need to talk to and talk about in legislation, but I think we also need to talk about the arc of legislation. It's not going to happen some more. Crypto, moves, crypto has moved Washington further than it has ever gone in terms of action, but at the end of the day, we're talking about getting a whole bunch of, it's not just the SEC, CFTC, it's also the OCC, CFPB, and so many other agencies in addition to two bodies of Congress. But I'm optimistic about where we're heading. I think members are much more educated than they were than when the Blockchain Association was created three and a half years ago. And I think we're past the point where they're skeptical about financial inclusion. I think it's the issue is trust. It's not whether the technology is there. And, you know, we're, we're doing the steps in terms of education. Susan, uh, maybe you can jump in here uh, to Clev's point about how these technologies can impact uh, individuals and communities and talk about that from the metaverse perspective. Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, policy isn't so much my wheelhouse, but I, I do think a lot about how the data we collect on um, immersive technologies and, and similar um, technologies will actually influence individuals in ways that, you know, we need to um, sort of think about now, right? So Bill was talking about it being an inflection point. Um, these are the kinds of things we have to think about as systems are planned and built. Um, and so, you know, from a research perspective, when we think about moving forward into the metaverse, I mean, I talked about some of the technology we're likely to use to experience aspects of the metaverse uh, being immersive, but what does that really mean? I mean, it means that it envelops all of your senses. Um, you can superimpose it on the real world. That's another option. But it also means a lot of tracking technologies. So it means technologies uh, related to motion capture, eye tracking. People are building physiological measurement into headsets. Um, you know, we're envisioning providing scent and uh, haptic interfaces for people. Uh, again, all runs on data. All the data goes somewhere. You know, to make a VR environment move right now, we are capturing data at at least, you know, 60 times per second, 90 times per second, even more. Um, all that data can impact people because we can make all kinds of inferences from it. So we can look at those data and we can tell, you know, with some degree of, of, of accuracy, whether you've had a traumatic brain injury in the past. You know, we can use it to look at um, early onset 
of, um, you know, degenerative brain disease. I mean, there are all sorts of things researchers are doing right now that are very much related to the kinds of data that we see building sort of the backbone of our experiences in the metaverse in the future. So these are the kinds of things that can have real impacts on people. Um, you know, and the medical stuff is sort of where I live, but there are also things around um, figuring out people's preferences, their emotional states, their mindsets. I mean, it all sounds like science fiction, um, but I'm a social psychologist, and you know, there are all kinds of tells in our behavior as to our, our mental states. Okay, so these are the kinds of data that we need to think about. Um, and we need to think about them kind of quickly because they can all have all kinds of implications for people depending on you know, whose hands they are in. Um, I was just in the panel on um, XR and the workforce. You know, imagine your employer having that data if you're going to be using XR for employment via the metaverse. You know, so that's one of the data streams I think we really have to think about. Um, I think the other one in terms of individual impact is uh, more related to sort of the not so much what you give off, but what comes in. Right, so if your entire experience is data, um, who controls what you're seeing? Uh, probably algorithms and AI. Um, you know, some to some extent, what you've chosen to see. Um, but you know, that's going to become your reality. One thing we do know, you know, from psychology is that the brain does tend to treat VR experience as real life. Okay, so these things can become quite real, um, and these are a lot of issues we're still grappling with. The research is nascent. Um, it is, you know, really early days in all of this research. And I think there's a lot that we still need to figure out about how people experience virtual environments, virtual worlds, how we form communities, how we communicate, um, even really basic questions around how these uh, actual VR technologies might influence a developing child's visual system. You know, these are the kinds of really early questions that we don't have really great answers to yet. Um, and so, you know, very different realm from what some of my um, co-panelists are talking about here, but I think it just goes to show, you know, how many places we really need to get better education, better understanding, and I think at the end of the day, better research, better data to make our decisions based on. Kurt, I'm hoping you can jump in here because you really kind of bridge this gap, I think, nicely between the science and the policy, which is like our, protecting our civil liberties here as we collect all of this data for the metaverse. Absolutely, and this is this is very important. Actually, I want to uh, hit on something that was come up a theme here about the value of, of educating and educating policymakers because one of the challenges that we, we've had uh, in dealing with regulations of the internet of new technology is making sure that those regulations and those uh, laws about it are based on a knowledge of what the technology is, does, can do, uh, and you have much better policy choices if they're made by someone with full information. Sometimes there might be disagreements about how they should go, but it's still better to do it with, with good information about what it is. And the other thing that I think is important is we are, you know, some of these technologies have been around in, in some form uh, for, for a number of years, for, for blockchain technologies, distributed technologies, uh, uh, VR and XR technologies, but they are becoming much more prominent uh, and they're still in a developing mode. And so this is an opportunity to make sure that we are considering civil liberties, privacy, freedom of expression, making sure that our human rights come with us into the future. Uh, and so I mean, on, on the on metaverse, as, as Susan was saying, it collects a tremendous amount of, of da data. Egocentric data is sometimes called, where it's data about what you are and, and you know, how your eyes are moving, if it's coupled with some other sensors like a smartwatch and get your pulse rate. And this can be a tremendous amount of information about you. It could be used to find inferences that could uh, lead to a view of what's in your mind. And in many cases, we've also seen inferences uh, taken which have uh, biased views that come from machine learnings that is improperly put together, and it makes wrong assumptions about this, and both of these are actually uh, problematic. So I think it is uh, critically important, just on, you know, hit on, the, on the metaverse, for example, that as we have this thing, we'll take all of this data and put it together that we make sure that we respect the, the privacy that we've always wanted to have and make sure the future right, is one that we would want to live in. And uh, to use one example that is, is AR technologies, uh, where uh, often cases they envision having a camera in your glasses and then you walk around. Uh, and this can be tremendously useful to, to make cool technologies and like with all of this, there are cool things that can happen. But at the same time, if everybody has a camera in their glasses 
and that goes into a central location where it can be obtained. That gives somebody a time machine. They can get all the views of all the different people that were in a location and see the things that were happened there that was sort of previously kind of inconceivable. I, well, you know, the term is often a panopticon. Uh, and this brings us to one of the values of some decentralization is that having a metaverse, which is a, you know, a world of worlds, like the internet was a network of networks, can help protect against having that single point of failure, having all of your, your, your data being gathered by your, your goggles or your AR glasses, have your, maybe stay on your device and not go to a central location, and what needs to be exchanged can be exchanged peer-to-peer. -peer. And so having some of these decentralization technologies can be uh, both a protection against the centralization of this data and easy point of access, but also some of the lack of competition that comes out when there are only a few centralized locations that are providing the service. And I would add that, I think you, you alluded to this, a metaverse already exists, right? In gaming, there's a virtual world where gamers exist in their avatars, have relationships in their avatars, have whole lives in their avatars. So, so there is, you know, a, a framework for helping to actually envision this. I think the concerns you raise are my concerns because as we have this initial iteration of what a decentralized metaverse could look like, it looks very much like an exclusive club for the wealthy right now. But right? I, every time I hear the metaverse, I remember seeing a story that somebody has already purchased the house next to Snoop Dogg for five hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> right? And so, so when we talk about accessibility and you know fixing some of the problems of Web two, we have to think about how is this accessible? You know, rural communities, urban communities, right? Women, seniors. These are the people who actually use the internet right now, rely on it, depend on it. So we have to build and make sure, and you alluded to this, you know, artificial intelligence is great. We have to innovate. We can't stop innovation because we have concerns, but racial profiling is a big concern. We're not going to fix all these problems before we innovate, but we have to at least be thinking about them and, think, and, and talking about how do we at least mitigate for them. And I will just add to this that, you know, as we think about the metaverse and the massive amounts of data that it both creates and is required to build the metaverse, um, a project like Filecoin is like a super interesting thing to think about because where do you want that data to be stored? Do you want it to be stored in a big centralized, with a big centralized storage provider or do you want it to be truly distributed and who owns that data and how do you share permissions with that data? So that's one of the things that we're working on at the foundation that I think is very exciting. Um, Bill, where are we timing-wise on sort of where, where are policymakers now and how do we get them up to speed and how long do you think that will take? Yeah, um, I mean, I think conversations like this are very helpful and I think it's very important to break things down incrementally. Um, a lot of times I see folks in the, the tech side in particular with these big home run swing ask. Um, and I think that's important to, you know, kind of prime the conversation of where we want to be in maybe 10 years or, or whatever the time frame may be. But there has to be an incremental buildup. And I think that's been um, sort of where staff and, uh, you know, policymakers and, and even private side individuals need to get a little better and more thoughtful because we know, you know, like regulatory clarity. I think that's hugely, hugely, massively important. Um, and I'd like to say that's a, a one-year conversation. But I, I think it's, it's the bake, breakdown in these incremental um, things. And, and what scares me is that, you know, Congress in particular is a very reactive institution. Um, bad thing happens, okay, it gets attention. So it's much harder to do this on the front end um, and kind of lead up to it. And so just as, you know, policymakers are learning these things, I think it's also important for, uh, you know, policy advocates and industry advocates to also recognize that policy isn't made in one fell swoop, that there are things like the appropriations process, you know, is kind of a big uh, missed moment where um, a, a provision snuck into a must-pass bill, like, I'm sorry, that's, 
you know, whether the, the hill is broken or not is a different conversation, but three or four must-pass bills move every year. So something of consequence was always going to happen like that. Uh, so it's just, you know, I'm not saying Washington as it is. I'm not defending it. I think both sides need to get uh, to a better understanding on how they work and then realize that this incremental approach. So I'd like to say meta metaverse is probably 10 years out, but all these privacy things I think will start to be the consistent um, thing. And then I think what happens with the data and who has access and the who is in control of whatever the metaverse is, I think those are the questions we have to keep in mind um, along that, along that um, time period. Kurt, um, is EFF, how is EFF, like, first of all, are there past experiences with sort of the pot, like shaping policy making that we can look to as guides for where we are now? I mean, absolutely, but I think you know it is also a difficult process. It's saying that uh, you know educating uh, the policymakers about the technology, right? Very, very key to have, a, have an understanding of it, uh, and this this comes through in, in, in a sense of like. Even if the bill like is defining a term, if it's defining a term without knowing what that term really is, you're going to get some bad regulation. So education is, is very important, but also uh, I think we can recognize and maybe take take advantage of the experience that we've had with the internet and and policymakers over the last several years is to realize the value of getting core principles embedded within the technology uh, as, as early as possible. It's a lot easier to have a technology that develops with having you know, protection of human rights and free expression and privacy and security as, as concepts within it than to have it develop without those things and then try and engineer it in later. Uh, and we have that, that opportunity right now um, to create a space where we can, we can move forward you know, to, a, to a brighter future because these, these technologies provide tremendous promise if done well. And that's what we're, we're, we're trying to achieve. It's also extremely difficult, I also would say. Like, any regulation is, at best, as good as the understanding is of where the technology is at the time. So you have to make sure that these things are forward-looking. They give space for innovating and innovating in ways that people don't currently expect. Very challenging thing to do, but also very important. That's great. We have about 10 minutes left. Do we have any questions? Hi. Um, I think this conversation has revolved a lot around you know, cryptocurrencies and stable coins and kind of like where we are right now. Um, and that's rightfully so, because that's where the bill is thinking. That's, that's kind of the problem that we're looking at now. But kind of to uh, Kurt's point about, you know, looking forward and creating regulations and laws that you know, don't limit what happens in the future. I think that that's where a lot of the promise of a lot of this technology is. You know, I think the file point is, a, is an extension. It doesn't really fit within the crypto stablecoin dynamic, but it's also very important. You know, we talk about uh, player in the metaverse, or, you know, I mean, heck, even um, Jack Dorsey's trying to do uh, decentralized social media, right? Um, so which aspects of this technology do you all see being immaculately important going forward? What are the, what are the things you're worried about um, outside of kind of the crypto stablecoin um, current dynamic that we're talking about? Because that's, I mean, that's where we're going, right? I just want to say you stole my last question, but that's okay. No, I think it's great. I like that there is so much beyond crypto as a store of value um, that I would, that's a great question about like sort of where do you see this headed? What projects are most exciting to you? Or terrifying. Or terrifying. I'm happy to jump in. Uh, I'm glad uh, the smartwatch was brought up earlier and um, really just a GPS tracker and a heart rate monitor can be a little scary in the information that has. Like, oh, you're out at midnight and your heart rate's a little all over the place. Like, maybe you should get a, a targeted ad for wanting a pizza in an hour. Like, that's a very basic example, but it's not hard to project that into a scary realm. And I think it was Susan that mentioned, you know, the, the brain's ability to separate um, reality from, um, you know, what we are currently experiencing. I, I think that's what gets a little... Unnerving is the more uh, time one spends in this stuff. It gets really cool. I'm not arguing that. But I think these things of what is real versus what isn't and, you know, how it impacts kids, 
um, and developing minds, I, I think a lot of lines get blurred. And so we just have to be very thoughtful on the front end that these things aren't manipulated. And, um, you know, it, it, what scares me is it gets in the wrong hand and you, you let somebody like a authoritarian government shape a metaverse. Like it, it makes it much easier to amplify things that aren't great. So I think it, it can go, you know, we're kind of at a fork moment and I hope we kind of go down the, the good, the good part of it. <laughs> and I'll add, I, I, I'm, I think the conversation about whether we should regulate cryptos as commodities versus securities is a long play. We're not going, we're not going to decide that. So if we shift to more basic things, I think the, the success of NFTs was because it was not about crypto. It was about creators who for decades struggled to figure out how to first protect their monetary, sorry, protect their intellectual property, monetize, and then create a marketplace. They were searching for a tool and they found a tool. So crypto just happened to be the solution. But at the, while they're actually leveraging this tool, they're learning a new skill. They're actually learning a new skill that can actually help transcend them beyond creators. So I think skills training is one we have to think about because we keep talking about the, the jobs of the future and we, we talk about smart cities as well. Here's an opportunity to find what are some of the applications that really align with average people like NFTs help to, the great thing about crypto and artificial intelligence, most of the emerging technologies, you don't need a degree. Most of the applications are drag and drop. How do we get regular people engaged, give them access to these job opportunities, but most importantly, prepare the masses for the innovation economy, right? We can create a decentralized web and a metaverse, but if the masses are operating outside of it, it's just going to be a nice country club. So what I was going to say actually does kind of build off of, um, you know, I'll say what Bill is talking about is one of the things that keeps me up at night. If we're creating people's realities, you know, who is creating the realities? Um, and that's true in a virtual situation, but it's also, I think, true if you think about AR. So we talked about Snoop Dogg's house and, you know, buying the house, the virtual house next to it. You know, on what system? Like, in whose world? So who's going to control the layer of metadata that we're going to see over everything? You know, we probably, you know, the example given is, you know, probably it's not going to be okay to stick a Burger King sign on a McDonald's, right, in the real world, on the AR, you know, on the metadata level. But, you know, who, who will control that? What are the rules around that? You know, I think um, it's going to be really exciting, you know, to be able to blend the real and the virtual. Um, and, and I think there are lots of great opportunities. Actually, also to Bill's example, um, you know, in the uh, medical world, you know, there are interventions where if you're near a bar where you used to go drink, you know, and you have a substance use disorder and your heart rate's in, and you're sort of in that geofence, your smartwatch can say, hey, you're in danger, you know, and that's a fantastic application. But that's, you know, under, could be under HIPAA, it could be under IRB regulate. You know, there's a, there's a framework in which these kinds of things are happening um, where there's a sort of known set of data protections. So I'll stop there and pass it to Kurt. Yeah, so I, I, I want to take it up a level. I think that, that one of the sort of the, the core principles is, you know, giving user-centric user control as a, as a way of, of pushing back against some of these bad outcomes and, and having things be in the user interest. We were talking about, you know, we've given some examples of with all this additional information, you know, you could get advertised to, or maybe it could, it could find out about a medical situation that you need awareness above. And you can see how the same information could be used to help you, to provide you valuable information that you can take a positive step about and could be used to sell you something to, uh, and I think also just, in disinformation, to you know, hit your emotional buttons and try to manipulate your political feelings, like all these things that can come from this data. And the key is to try to make this, you know, trying to look at the, the future in a way that you're saying, is this a user? Is it helping the user? Is it a technology that is using this information in ways that are positive to the user? Is it protecting the user? Or is it using it to manipulate the user? Is it trying to take it, take advantage of them? And I think if we if we steer to the former, that as a, as a principle will help us get to that better spot. 
I actually think that's a really lovely place to land this conversation. Um, are, we, uh, are we about out of time? Well, wonderful. Thank you all so much for coming. This was great. Thank you, panelists. Thank you.